never be a rock. Got a lot of reverb on me today, Megan. I'm sounding thick, thick in the mix, deep in the cave. <laughs> How's everybody doing this morning? Um, I want to take a minute to go live. We haven't done this in a minute. I feel like uh, there's been so much going on that I, I haven't come back to just uh, to just go live and talk to you guys a bit. And I always love doing it because um, it's the best way to connect with a lot of the people I know here from the community. Uh, good morning. How you doing, Past Life Explorer? It's good to see you. Uh, hello, Daniel. Uh, there are a lot of praying hands. Those praying hands? They look like praying hands. Megan, is that a praying hands? I would say yes, they are. Praying hands. Uh, listen, um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you guys about today was uh, I'm always talking to creators, uh, trying to uh, empower more creators to get out there and um, do the very thing that I do for a living um, and help them reach their own goals and um, set up their goals and then try to reach them and achieve the things that they, they would like to get out of creating. Um, make YouTube channels, make video content, make anything. Get out there and try to try to be creative. And I think... Um, I think along the way, what happens sometimes is we get hyper focused on little silly things like, is this the right thumbnail? Is this the right title? Is this the right, you know, who knows what, guitar in the background of my set? Is this the right microphone? <laughs> I don't know if this is the right microphone. I just bought this yesterday. Megan and I were out shopping and I ran across this microphone. I said, I'm buying that and I, I'm trying this one out. So I hope it sounds all right. Um, but and it's not that those other things I just talked about are not important. They're all they're all important. All of that stuff is important. But the reality of trying to create content and trying to grow YouTube channels, um, I think what happens is we get super hyper focused on these little individual pieces of the things that um, come with the journey, and we lose uh, we lose sight of the very thing that I think is the most important, and that's really connecting with an audience, understanding who you're trying to make content for, why they might want to watch your content. And then making stuff that they'd actually engage in. I've really gone down the rabbit hole of that recently. And I think, uh, I think it's one of those things that drives creators and creative types really nuts. Because when you don't connect or when things don't work out, or if you spend a lot of time making content and you just don't get the views or you don't get the subscribers or whatever the short-term goal is that people set themselves up for as measurements of success... That it can be really disheartening, and I think a lot of creators end up getting frustrated because they think, well, I, I didn't hit that goal, so I must be failing. And that's often not, not the case, not the case at all. Uh, look at there, there we go, not a rock star. Day 37, still not a rock star. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, I don't know what day it is. I, I lost count since the original hater posted his video about me, so I have to pull my calendar back up make sure i'm up on the clock for the right amount of days um so i, I want to take a second and just have a conversation with you guys i've really been trying to focus on things that can help me grow the channel effectively one of the things i was talking to um matt koval the other day in, a, in in just a private chat we got together and hung out for a bit i don't know if you guys know matt he's um he's a great youtube content creator he actually was the he worked for youtube he was the creator liaison youtube liaison for forever um, which is a job that now um, Renee Ritchie has, who he's fantastic at it. But Matt was the guy who we just, a lot of us grew up with, Matt being the guy. Just a really, really smart guy who's worked with tons of creators and tons of channels and just knows a lot about YouTube and the process and what creators go through, and he's a creator himself. And we were really just talking about, you know, what you know what the hurdles are for creators and what what happens to creators along the way Matt made a great video where because he's been exposed to so much data we're having worked for YouTube he was able to see that the creator lifespan from people who started to when they sort of this they would f like I don't want, do we say fizzled out they got kind of get to the point where things just kind of fell apart and they went from doing well to not doing well and kind of disappearing that whole lifespan is only about 5 to 7 years on YouTube and when you think about that, that is, that's brutal. That's the kind of thing that you think about almost like a, a, an athlete who gets into major league, you know, a major league football, the major league baseball or professional football or baseball or soccer, or pick your, I don't know, pick your sport. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about for sports. But what it is, is you, you have this lifespan. And even if you do really well, you only have a very short period of time to sort of be successful on the platform. And Matt had, had reached out because we were talking about, well, what happens when a channel dies? Like a channel that you may have 
had success and then it disappears. Does that mean you're done? And the reason I had been talking to him is because my channel on the surface absolutely met that the criteria. If you'd looked at my channel, you would have said, wow, there was a point where Daniel's channel was driving about 5,000 new subscribers every week, um, about a quarter million views every week at its peak. Um, and then it started rolling off over time. I've done made videos talking about why that happened. It wasn't YouTube. It was, you know, it's always in the, the hands of the creator. Um, and I had gotten to the point where only months ago, my channel has a, had a net loss of subscribers every month, meaning every month when I would look at what I gained versus what I lost, I lost subscribers. So I was losing, you know, 100, 200 subscribers every month. And I was just watching the views go down and everything just wasn't quite working. And I was trying different things to sort of pivot the channel to make sure it connected. And then I was able to do that with the conversation we had about licenses and, and um, other things, <laughs> haters, music, rock and roll, <laughs> um, mental health. And the channel's, you know, the channel's doing better than it's, than it's done in its lifetime. So there is the ability to, to connect um, with people and that, and, and I, I'm one of those people who feel that, you know, you're never, YouTube isn't a death sentence. It's in YouTube isn't, it's not YouTube, it's you and the people you're trying to reach. And if you can always understand that that's what it comes down to is reaching people it makes it a lot easier to get out there and then start actually creating content that connects with the very people you're trying to reach. And you can hit some of those goals. Um, did I see a David comment? What do you think about <laughs> I hope this was directed at me because I think anyone who calls me David should get bonus points. I, I got to have a shirt that says, that says, um, who's David? <laughs> Just, who's David with a question mark? Um, David Patel is my favorite um, YouTube content creator. Well, there was a question in there, wasn't it? What do you think about TikTok affecting YouTube traffic? I guess that's one of those things, you know, do I, d that's one of those little things. Does that matter? Do you wake up? Does anyone wake up here and any of you guys in the chat? Do any of you guys think, oh no, TikTok is out there? Um, it's going to hurt me as a YouTube content creator. Uh, give me a, if anything, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, yes or no. Does it, do any of you guys out there think about that? Like, oh no, the, the advent of YouTube has now somehow hurt content creators um, and, and somehow made it problematic for us. Uh, Doug is really right on top of it and says, nope. Um, uh, home, uh, rapid repair says no, uh, power purpose says no. Um, I like this one. TikTok. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, I, this is one of the things that I think my friend, um, we're, we're video content creators. How could we ever be hurt by yet another video platform becoming popular in the mainstream? I think, um, this is one of the things that, Again, trying to think about making content and connecting with people and deciding what the goals are going to be in your journey as a YouTube content creator. I, I posted this on Twitter the other day. I had someone who, who left me a comment. Well, I had, had a video that talked about thinking about shorts and integrating them into your content strategy. And the, and the commenter, and it's not the first time I've got a comment like this, said like, well, if you start posting shorts, I'm going to unsubscribe. And I nicely said, well, see ya. <laughs> you know, it's nice knowing you because I've been posting shorts since they first came out. And I think they're important. I'm not saying that everyone should, should make shorts. I'm saying that everyone should consider making shorts. It's really funny. I, there's this whole subculture of what's appropriate um, and, and ultra analyzing YouTube content. Um, if you were ever sitting with somebody and having a conversation and someone predicated the importance or the value of the things you were talking about based on how long it took you to say it, that would be a tough, that would be a tough relationship to live in. Uh, because as you can see right now, I'm live. So I'm going to be talking to you and we'll be going probably longer than I would on a regular video. Does that mean the value of what I'm talking about today because we're live is less important than if it was something I could have said more, you know, with more brevity? Does that mean if I decided to make a short later on and started talking about something that I needed that I thought could be said in 30 seconds or 40 seconds, that that was no longer important? I don't think it's about the length. I think it's about, I think it's about the value. How, how, how important is the thing you're making? Is it, is it, is there a reason you're making it? Does it have value for the viewer? Does it have value for you? Um, is one of the things that you want to think about. Gnome Productions is now a YouTube channel member. Um, welcome to the club. 
we do some pretty in-depth things here um, uh, on the channel in the in the memberships group. Do me a favor, head over to the memberships tab, um, and there's a link in there where you can apply to get access to our Facebook group. And even if you hate Facebook, join just for that group because we do um, real in-depth channel growth strategy stuff every single day in there. Welcome aboard. So when you're thinking about these kind of things, I, I really want to have a discussion with what you guys are focusing on. Let me ask you guys a simple question. What's the thing that you guys worry about every single day? Every time you're thinking about YouTube, what's in your head? Um, and be honest. I mean, there's, there's no judgment here. Do you wake up every day and think, I just wish I had more views? I wish I had more subscribers? I wish I had... If, if When you think about that and you say... You know, what is that thing that I wish I had? What is it? Talk to me. Throw those words down in the chat so I can see what you guys are thinking. I'd like to know what some of the goals are. Because if I know what some of the goals are, sometimes we can re reevaluate how we can hit some of those goals. And that we can make them accessible to creators out there instead of, you know, panicking over YouTube and, and the right you know, individual things like, is it my thumbnails? Is it my title? <laughs> is it all of that? Um, it's funny. Views. Opinion Rat says views. Power Purpose says both views and subs. The, uh, the Car Wash Channel of Northern Pennsylvania and Ohio says, hello from Ohio. Thank you for the super chat. Um, hope you get some reasonable weather out there. Um, wait a minute. How close? Wait, where was the, where was the derailment, Megan? Ohio. Was it Ohio? Was that where the derailment was? I Man, so, hope yeah. you guys are okay out there. There's that, that train derailment that has a, some toxicity to it that everyone's freaking out about. And I, I hope you're okay out there. So uh, stay safe. Um, thank you for the super chat. I'm um, trying to see what people are um, saying here. I wish I know exactly where to focus. Yeah, true. I totally feel that. Tish uh, Artis Haven says, facing my imposter syndrome. Boy, that's a big one, Tish. Um, I certainly had moments of that recently when one of the videos I put up um, broke a million views in less than two weeks. And there was a lot of people saying some very nice things to me that I appreciated, but I know that I am a flawed individual flawed human and when people are like you're just the greatest it's like okay <laughs> you didn't watch me just you know trip over the cat and smash my face onto the corner of the wall and you know swear at my you know feet <laughs> i am far from perfect but yeah that when you start having certain success there's definitely a um even if you don't have a lot of success just being out there and feeling like i'm not who people think i am um one of the reasons i love doing this to just getting going live and talking to people is you get to see me warts and all, which, you know, I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but it certainly allows people to have conversations and realize that we are all just human and we are all just out there trying to make content um, growth. That's a great one. Breaking free off grid growth, period, right? Just str straight to the point. What, you, what are you looking for? I'd like to get more growth. Um, I worry about entertaining my audience. It's an in interesting comment there, Nintendo Sense. Um, entertaining your audience is, is something that I used to really fret over too. Like, are they going to, is this going to, am I going to, is this monkey going to dance for them in a way that they will respond? And one of the things I've pivoted much more towards is less about entertaining people and, and, and more about engaging people, right? I want, I don't want, I don't want to be the street performer anymore that people walk by and go, you know, I'm just walking down the street and I'm going to stop and I'm going to watch you. And only if you're, you know, ultra skilled and have the best jokes or can juggle, you know, six chickens while you're riding a unicycle, then maybe I'll stop and watch and I'll throw a couple of dollars in your, you know, in your tip jar. That's a very hard way to live as a creator. I think one of the things I've tried to embrace more often now is instead of entertaining the audience is understanding the audience and what holds value for them and where they might be struggling and where we have commonalities in a conversation and then bringing those commonalities to light and, and having conversations about it. Because I think there's a lot of people out there who do use YouTube to sort of be entertained and they do use YouTube to um, sometimes gain information. They're trying to look to, for the answer to something. But I had a long conversation the other day, like I said, and um, I was telling Matt, like, Matt Koval, I said, I, it's tough being, I don't want to be a utility channel. I don't want to be a resource channel. I don't want to be the guy who just shows you how to do some trick in some video editing software because then someone watches that and they go, thanks, and they leave. I said, you know, how many times have I opened up YouTube and said, I need to know how to, 
you know, swap the transmission in a 97 Plymouth Voyager. And I open up and I find the best video that shows me how to do it so that when I'm doing it, I, this is, I actually did do this, um, got through it and I could not tell you what that channel was. I could have never looked at that channel again. It was very useful in the moment, but it was only useful for that moment. And f as creators, one of the things we want to think about is what are we trying to do here? You know, what's the goal? Is the goal to be useful in the moment? Sometimes. There are some channels that absolutely just only try to be that. But I think in general, one of the things that you want to think about when you're trying to grow on YouTube is why would someone who watched yesterday's video stick around and want to watch tomorrow's? Because I think it really is true that people don't subscribe for the video they're watching. They subscribe for the expectation of what might be coming next. And I think that you have to, as creators, embrace that and go, wait a second. It's just not entertaining them and tap dancing and making them smile right now. It's giving them a reason to come back. And that can be extremely liberating, ext extremely nerve wracking, but it changes your perspective because then it's like, well, I'm not just trying to, you know, dazzle them in the moment. I'm, I'm really trying to um, create a conversation that makes them go, I enjoyed that. That was just, you know, I, I know, it made me think, or I, maybe I learned something. Maybe it was entertaining. Maybe it made me think. Um, maybe it, 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 it hit home with me in a way based on something that I might be experiencing. And when all these factors start working together, um, that's when you can really start having a connection with uh, a broader target audience. So entertaining, I think, is a piece of it. But you don't always just have to be entertaining. Foot Dr. Zach with the $1.99 Super Chat. I worry people will eventually get sick of me. Well, uh, I didn't want to say it, but I can't believe you're here again. Could you please? I'm <laughs> just kidding. Foot Dr. Zach, who's one of my, um, one of my favorite creators, um, he's actually um, someone I work with. Um, his channel, he just, uh, just recently got his silver play button. Uh, he hit 100,000 subscribers. Uh, he's an actual foot doctor. Um, who looks at uh, athletic footwear from the inside out. He usually he gets these like really expensive shoes before anybody gets them, takes a knife to them and slices them open, <laughs> shows you how they're built. Um, that's a legitimate point, um, Zach. Like, do, am, I, am I just going to keep repeating myself over and over again to the point where people are like, good Lord, <laughs> I am so tired of you doing that one thing, monkey. I'm, I'm moving on to the next street corner. <laughs> I'm going to the next carnival barker because I'm tired of just listening to you do the thing over and over. I had that same, that same fear, and I experienced that with... Um, the Filmora stuff, when I was doing a lot of Filmora tutorials and I kept coming back to that bucket of just making new tutorials, it, I felt the same thing. I was like, holy cow, I'm going to live and die by, by what magic trick I can teach someone with one specific video editing software, which is not why I wanted to become a creator. I, I wanted to become a creator to help empower other creators and show them that they can make content and talk to them about growing cha uh, channels on YouTube and reaching people and creating connection and, and hitting goals, whether that was just doing YouTube for fun and enjoying learning how to make and edit videos and put them up and just, ha you know, have creating a little community or potentially doing ex exactly what you did, Zach, which was really making it a business. Um, you know, Zach does very well with his channel right now. Um, and I do very well with my channel. You know, this is what, you know, this is what I do for a living. Um, Zach is a doctor. Um, he moved recently. Well, he did a couple, there was a couple of m m lateral motions in his life. And he's, I mean, his channel is a full-time job for him right now because that's the kind of money that you can make if you really lock in and set some goals and decide how to work with, um, you know, enough different, you know, alternative rev revenue streams. But I think that, I, I have that same thing, Zach. I think... I think you're going to find that point in your life, well, as in your creative life, when you when you'll find that right time to move from one thing to the next. Because I certainly did. I f I felt like I had I had gone up the mountain and I got to the top of the mountain and then I started coming back down and I went, well, is this it? Is is this what happens? You know, do, you, you, I, am I that guy that you know five to seven years and your your channel you're all done? <laughs> Thank you. Move along. Uh, and I and I don't think it is. I think it really is. As long as you have the ability to reach people and have a conversation that they're interested in um, based on the things you like talking about. In your case, you know, Zach, it's, you know, it's the, the idea of all the cool um, tech that goes into these really amazing ath athletic shoes and how they compare. And when you, nobody's taking these 
two three hundred dollar shoes and brand new out of the box and slicing them open with an exacto knife and splitting them in half and showing the i mean that's just nuts what zach does so it's really and i think your conversation is always interesting in that but you might find that you get to the point where you go i don't want to do i don't want to i'm if i have to slice open one more shoe if I have to make one more Filmora tutorial, if I have to make one more gaming video, I'll, I'm going to, you know, smash my face against my microphone and call it quits because it's it's just so overwhelming. And I think that there's more. I think that you have the ability to sort of open up and try different things. Uh, there he is. What's going on, pal? Um, good to see you, Dano. Salute, brother. Uh, back from YouTube uh, break due to, due to music. Um, yeah, man. I, I uh, It's... Everyone needs a break every now and then, pal. Thank you for that. I really appreciate the super chat, my friends. Good to see you. Um, yeah, I think taking breaks is a big part of it. I took a little bit of a break recently. I'm kind of still in the middle of a break. Um, but one of the things I've been trying to do is find ways to change things up. I've been saying this for a long time. Finding something that isn't the creative thing you do. A lot of you out there, I think a lot of you out there, let me ask the question in the chat right now. How many of you out there... Um, give me a quick delineation of what you guys do. Are you? How many of you are full-time content creators, meaning all you do is you, you make content, whether it's for YouTube, YouTube, and other places? How many of you have are part-time YouTubers where you have a full-time job, um, and then you do YouTube on the side uh, as another job, and you but you still have another job because um, the revenue isn't there? Uh, and how many of you are just doing it for fun? Um, kind of b use whatever word describes yourself. Don't use my words if you don't like them. But let me know. Give me an idea of where you're, where you guys are at. Omar Gaming. Always knew you were a rock star. Well, depends who you ask. <laughs> depends who you ask. Thank you for the super chat. Um, part time. This is one part time. Part time. Uh, full time KMH family. Yeah, you got it. It runs in your family, right? Because you know the, the dot. Your daughter also has a fantastic channel. You guys are you guys are out there creating. It's awesome. Um, let me see. Full time fun. There you go. There's a good one. Part time. Um, let's see. I do two full time jobs. YouTube and that other thing. I hear you, Tish. I hear you. Fun. Uh, let's see. Thomas is side kind of a side gig. Uh, part time YouTube. So it's a little bit back and forth. Um, uh, uh, full time or six days a week. Yeah, I think that it's it's back and forth. Some are fun, some are part time, some are just uh, some are really looking to turn this into something. Uh, part time. I think we see a lot of part timers who are part timers right now because they're trying to figure out how to um how to how to go full time. You know, like how do you how do you how do you get that thing to be full time? How do you make things happen so that you can in fact. Uh, stop what you're doing and go, well, I want to I want to do this full time. I just haven't figured out a way to make enough money yet. I, it's interesting. I think for people out there who are part time and thinking about, well, I would like to go further with, than where I'm, I am with this. There's an interesting thing that happens. And I, I talk about this in my group a lot. I think that 10,000 subscribers is a very interesting mark in a creator's journey. And I don't think it has anything to do with the fact that it's a number. It's not like YouTube at 10,000 subscribers goes, oh, they've hit 10,000 subscribers. Now we can do something cool with them. Now we're going to recommend them more. Now we're going to you know, push them out to more people. It, it doesn't happen like that at all. In fact, what I think happens is... If creators have worked hard enough, I think there's, there's three, three of the hardest goals are the very first goal of hitting 100 subscribers. That's like, how many people think that hitting that first 100 subscribers was brutal? For me, it was like, man, that, that felt like, how do I even do this? Like, I feel like every subscriber, I could feel it land like a brick, like a boom. And it was another one. It was like one meant the world to me. And losing one... <laughs> was even worse it was like what did i do wrong why did you leave <laughs> i'm sorry i'll try not to do it again and then after the hundred the next one became thousand hitting the like the monetization threshold of getting a thousand subscribers and four thousand watch hours of, of um watch time um in a 365 day cycle that was really hard. But there's a thing that happens when you're going from right when you hit monetization and you realize, oh, crap, I'm not really making any money. I have to actually drive more views and get more watch time and that's, you know, do the whole thing. There's something happen happens that as you build up to 10,000 subscribers, 
Um, and I could have done that that a, a different way. I could have said X amount of watch time also could have been the same metric. There's usually somewhere like about 10,000 subscribers and between a million and two million watch hours. We learn how to do the thing. We just physically learn how to do the thing. Like imagine yourself jumping on a piano every day for an hour, hour and a half, and just learn, trying to learn how to play piano every day in the morning for an hour and a half. What would happen after the 10,000th day of doing that, right? Now, if you would put any kind of real effort into it, you would be a much better piano player. You know, when you hit that mark, then you would have been after you've been playing for 10 days. Is that because the piano suddenly likes you more? Is that because um, there's a music algorithm or AI that goes, okay, you've hit the magic mark, bing, we're going we're gonna to allow the piano to be better for you? And it's not, it's just because you put the time in and you've learned along the way and you've learned what's important. Hey, Dan Banyan, good to see you, pal. Thanks for the super chat. It's very nice to see you, my friend. Um, Dan's, uh, Dan, uh, Dan, you're new to the group too. Did you get, I'm, I've got, I'm trying to connect everybody here. Uh, I appreciate the super chat. Uh, I hope to talk to you, um, more privately soon in group and around. Um, thank you again for that super chat. Yeah. I think there's a thing if you guys, and I think that when we talk about 10,000 subscribers, it can be such a massively scary number, but you'll be surprised. Every creator I've worked with, everybody in my group says the same thing. Yeah, it was really hard to get to 100. Then it was really hard to get to 1,000. And it was brutal to get to 10,000. And then I say, okay, how hard was it to get from 10,000 to 20,000? And every one of them says, oh, it was like I blinked and I was there. I didn't even think about it. One, because you stop worrying about subscribers and you start worrying about making content that connects. You've probably made... 50 to 100 videos at that point anyhow so you've gotten better at it you've learned how to make thumbnails you've learned how to edit better you've learned how to film better you've learned how to make your audio sound better make everything look a little better everything just starts getting better because you've put the time in so i think one of the things i would say when it comes to the very question we were talking about before was like you know what's the what are you looking to do i'd like to get more views i'd like to get more subscribers i'd like more growth it really begins with you having to just like bit and grit grit your teeth bear down and go this is going to be a journey i'm going to have to just keep doing it and then trying to slowly improve as i as i do this over time uh series seven guru thank you very much for the 20 dollars super chat your your advice really set my subscriber count uh gain momentum thanks awesome i, I appreciate that um the Car Wash Channel of Northern PA in Ohio says, once I get up, get to my computer, I'd like to join your channel. I would love your help. Yeah, please do. Um, the way that works is, yeah, just hit the join button underneath any of my videos or on my channel. Uh, and once you do that, um, it opens up. If you go to the perks section of the membership tab, it shows you how to get into the Facebook group and everything. And you just all you got to do is drop your channel URL and my channel manager, Megan, authorizes it. And then you're in. And it's a great place to it's a great place to hang out. I promise you it's worth every penny. We, we, we really work hard in there. Our success rate in the group, I've stopped counting. It's hundreds of times higher than the platform average. Um, people who work in our group, because we get hyper-focused on these conversations. Yeah, sometimes we get deep into thumbnails. Yes, sometimes we get deep into titles. Yes, sometimes we get deep into looking at channels and really thinking about what we can do to improve. But one of the things um, that's that I really want to talk about today, which is, is, is less of that and more of just trying to think about the other things that you can do here to start getting your head in the right space. And then we go another full-time job in YouTube. Yeah, I hear you. Boy, that's really hard. I used to have to do that exact same thing. Work every day as a, I was a, I was a general contractor, so I remodeled um, homes for a living. I would just every single day get up, go to work, you know, that would be 60, 70 hours a week. And then I'd come home and I'd film and edit at night. And it was brutal. And I couldn't wait to make a decision what I was going to do with my life. And it took a while to, to get to the point where I could, I could, you know, close down the business and just do this. But it was, it was scary. And it took a lot of work. But one of the things I'm realizing now that I think is really important is really understanding um, having those other things in your life um, can be super important and it can be tricky when you don't have a lot of time. I think time can be very, can be one of those things like time management is the hardest thing for me trying to figure out how to make the time all work. But um, 
sometimes finding something that's completely different. Like I mentioned the piano over there, playing piano. I actually did when the pandemic kind of hit. I went every morning, I bought that piano, and I don't really play piano. But I bought it, and I put it there, and every morning I'd get up for an hour, hour and a half, and I would just put headphones on and clunk away at it. And, you know, t- how many years later are we here? Two and a half years later or whatever it was, you know, um, that rock star song, I wrote that on piano. I'm a guitar guy. I'm like, when I went to go write a song, I was like, we're writing it on piano. And that's what happened. Um, because I got better. I, I did it long enough that I got better at it. I'm by no means a great piano player. But I can play piano. I can actually get on it and I can play it and, and not feel like a complete hack. So I think these are the kind of things you want to think about. Finding something other than just the YouTube thing to change your perspective. Megan and I went out the other day um, for Valentine's Day. We went down to Boston and we took a pasta making course um, and it was a ton of fun it was just something different to do and it was interesting because making pasta was um megan remind me the recipe it was semolina uh, flour semolina and double zero flour and eggs and eggs so three ingredients right so there's three ing- ingredients there and that was it and it was like and we were taking this course and they were teaching us how to like you know, make the pasta correctly, the way to put it together, to form it, you know, just how long you have to work it together, the right consistency, the right amount of each of these simple three ingredients, and then getting it to work and then using the tools to actually, you know, draw out and make pasta, which was, which was something we had never done before. So it was like, well, you know, how, how do you do that kind of thing? But it was so rewarding because it was something that I had never done, Megan had never done. It made us really take a moment to think about, um, you know, putting our head into that thing, just focusing on that and trying to do it well. And there was just something very um, cathartic about that, that I was like, this, this is not unlike creating. Like, you sit there and we get so hyper-focused on, you know, are these the right eggs? Are they the right size eggs? What color eggs? What's the temperature? Pfft. Take the things, think about how they all work together, and suddenly everything starts changing for you. It just starts changing for you. Uh, Hooked by Robin. Thank you for the super chat, Robin. Anyone considering joining Daniel's group, do it. (laughs) The things you'll learn are more than uh, worth the tiny membership cost. Thank you, Robin. Robin's been in our group for a while, and she's crushing it, too. and I think I, I always ask the question. She finally did cross half a million subscribers. I always said, did you cross it yet? I finally did. Um, thank you for the super chat. And thank you for the kind words. Love having you in the group. Uh, same with you, Iman Le- uh, Lehi. Um, make sure you go to the memberships tab and click on that um, Facebook group link. And when you go there, just grab the URL from your channel and then put that um, into the admission. It asks you the questions. It tells you what you need to do. Just drop your channel URL so we can confirm it. Sometimes people have um, different Facebook names and they do channel names and it's impossible to see if they're a, mem- if they're a member or not. So just, just keep an eye on that. Uh, welcome to the group though. Um, John Ivan Art. My problem is balance. Doing what I do versus filming and editing. Now uh, with a deadline, it's even harder. Uh, I hear you. I hear you, John. I used to... Um, like I said, I used to be in construction, so I would be swinging a hammer and, and, and dealing with customers all day long and, you know, d- dealing with, you know, materials and deliveries and subcontractors. And then it became, you know, I had to go home and talk about video editing. So with me, it became a real, um, it became a real thing about, you know, I had to figure out one or the other, um, which one was going to be the priority. And because I was getting older and the body wasn't working so great and I'd had 35 years in the trades, I, you know, I, I really wanted to do the YouTube thing and I wanted to create. Uh, so it, I was able to make the transition, but I totally understand you. That balance is super tricky. I will say this, John, when you're thinking about what you do, you don't always have to separate the two. Don't always feel like everything you do has to be separate. I think there's... I think life overlaps, conversations overlap. Um, One of the things that I really had to train myself to do was to keep a camera bag with me when I go out. I I really, you would think the size of my channel, not that I'm a very big channel, but you would think the amount of years I've been doing this and the fact I do this full time, that I would have a camera bag with me pretty much all the time so that if something happened, like I see Peter McKinnon and he's always got like a camera hanging off his side and he's always ready to film and anything that happens, he's capturing it. And I'm like, 
but I don't even know how to do that. Like I'll carry my phone. And then even then I rarely pull my phone out to film. I do sometimes, but I don't think, I don't think like a creator. I still think like a general contractor who's doing a job. If I don't know that I need that tool with me, I don't bring it. And that's always been the way I've approached um, creating content. And it's only recently that I've changed the way my brain works. And I start thinking, I don't need to, uh, one thing, it's, it's fear. I think that if anyone has ever walked around with a camera strapped to their side, uh, you know, or, or filmed in public, it, it's nerve wracking, especially when people who are not used to it and they're walking by you and you're there filming and they just like, what the hell is going on here? The perfect example of that, John, was um, Megan and I, she can tell you, we, <laughs> we did one scene from the, um, the music video I did and I was on the beach and, and I, I wanted to have this dramatic uh, moment in the song where there, I wanted it to be, oh, okay, this is going to happen here where I'm, uh, I'm singing this song. And what's going to happen is, is I want this sort of big bridge section. I'm going to do this. It's going to be like, we need it like either in the mountains or something very landscape that was super dramatic. And what we came up with is because we live near the, the coast is, um, let me see if I can find this. Give me one sec. There it is. <laughs> we went. Oh, I'll go. Let's just go film down at the at the beach. But we want the like the right sunrise moment, right? So here, you know, I was like, here I am. I'm like playing away and doing my big dramatic moment, and oh, the heart felt. And uh, this is like seven in the morning. It's about eighteen degrees out. <laughs> Um, it's Megan and I on the beach. She's behind the camera. I'm standing out. And if you look closely, you can see that, um, I am in Doc Martens and my Doc Martens are sunk to the ground. I am like <laughs> up to the, my ankles in sand and water. It was just, it was just the, this, the total opposite. And now while we're doing this, there's people walking, there's early risers who get out and they walk their dogs on the beach in the morning. So there's these people that are bundled up and they're going by with their dogs. And there I am with a guitar, electric guitar dressed like this in the middle of the winter, sinking into the sand with Megan filming me and a little like um, Bluetooth boombox playing this song so that I can, you know, lip sync along to it. And they're just looking at me like, what on earth is happening here? And all I'm thinking is, is don't look at the dog because I love dogs. And dog, please don't bark because, you know, I'll, I'll throw me off. I'll, I'll definitely, it would, wouldn't affect, we weren't really using the sound. But if you start barking, I'm going to start laughing and it's going to throw me off. But that's, that's, that stuff is, is, you know, when people say like, oh, I'm so worried about my thumbnail change your mindset like we really st we really started thinking like how do we do something different how do we how do we get people to watch the content how do we do something that that people aren't expecting us to do um and it was hard i gotta tell you making that video was the hardest thing i've ever did because i was you know i've never made a full-length music video like that before um filmed on location um you know i had to i think in 13 days we wrote the song um recorded the song I sent it out to um, a friend of mine I worked with years ago when I actually was a professional musician, um, Bob St. John, who, who is, he's a Grammy award winning music producer. And I messaged him. He did like all the extreme albums. I don't know if you guys know who the band extreme is. You work with Duran Duran, but all those number one hits like more than words and, you know, get the funk out all those big, you know, big rock extreme. Well, more than words isn't really big rock. Is it? It's acoustic guitar. But, uh, you know, all that Nuno Betancourt stuff. And I'm like, I, I message him. I'm like, hey, Bob, can you mix a song for me? I, I got it done, but I, 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 I want a better mix than I can get. And he did, you know, and he did, he just got me. He's like, of course, you know, because we used to work years ago. We haven't worked together in a long time. But we had to have make that happen and then go film and then pull it all together. And I was using DaVinci Resolve. And do you know how much I knew about DaVinci Resolve? I, this much. <laughs> Maybe this much. I knew nothing of it. I just started using it. I'm like, yeah, here's a way to start learning uh, software. Let's do an epic music video, right? Uh, as the, as like the, you know, the third video we're making using this software. I, I just basically learned how to get the footage in and, and, you know, cut it. And I'm like, holy crap. So the, the idea of pushing yourself 
past the thing and changing your goals and don't don't get focused on just the subscribers and views get getting focused on like how can i do something different how can i think differently how can i approach this differently how can i start thinking more like a creator bring that camera bag with you think about getting up like you know i have a whole set here that i i love it very much in here but filming every video from here is boring for the viewer it's just like, yeah, guy with the guitars behind, I, I get it. So changing things up and trying to rethink the way we do things, I think is really important and can, and can change, it can change the momentum of your channel. And I think what you were saying, John, exactly that balance, finding that balance has a lot to do with changing what your end of it. All right. Like, I think sometimes what we do is we fall into these patterns of when I ask people like well, creators, like, well, why do you, why do you do, why do you do that thing that way? Whether it's, why do you make your titles that way? Why do you make your thumbnails that way? Why do you film your videos that way? Why, do, whatever it is, why do you do it that way? And the answer with that nobody ever wants to say, but I hear it every time is I do it that way because that's the way I've always done it. Which is the hardest habit to break. That was the hardest habit for me to break, was to go, wait a minute, don't just do it something the way that you're doing it because that's the way you've done it. Think about what you can do differently. Think about approaching something differently. Think about changing up the situation you're in so that you're looking at things differently. If you can sort of take your mind out of that moment and try something different, I think that's when really a huge you know things can happen I, I was telling you guys like megan and i went out pasta making this was like this is like <laughs> this pasta daniel <laughs> this apron on <laughs> you know we were just making pasta this is what we were doing there's megan going at it and there's our pasta and there we were just making pasta that was what we were doing that day and there was something about that moment of just going wait you know i, I a real creator probably would have had more footage of doing it rather than a few pictures and a quick, you know, camera shot. But the, I, I, one of the things with me was like, oh, you know, a lot of people are paying to be here for this class. I don't want to just start filming the whole thing and make it look like a, a Daniel Patel production. But in general, in life, you know, that whole day we were walking around with cameras and we were filming ourselves trekking around. And um, I think that's like one of the things that you can think about, you know, think about the amount of time you spend watching Netflix movies or the amount of time you spend just sitting on the couch or watching a football game or whatever you do. Try to think about how you can sort of change your um, routine and think about, throw a camera. I mean, get a little quick camera bag together, even if it's your phone. If it's your phone and you go, oh, I'm going to grab like a better microphone, like maybe a Rode Wireless Go so I can... Yesterday when we were wandering around, I had, um, we went up, we went up um, north a bit and I had just put a lavalier mic and a Rode Wireless Go into my pocket and the lav mic was just pinned onto me and I had the camera hanging by my side and the other, you know, the other end of the wireless go was attached to the camera so that at any minute I could just start filming or I could hand the camera to Megan and my signal was always going to be right here so she could walk 20 feet away and it was still perfect, not perfect audio, but, you know, lavalier, good, good audio. Uh, and it was right there, so that it was sending wirelessly to the camera. But I set myself up to be able to just do, just wander, and you could do that with a you can do that with a um, uh, even a, an iPhone or a mobile, you know, whatever phone you got, Android. Set something up so that it looks pretty good, sounds pretty good, and at any minute can capture something that might be usable in your content, whatever that is. Okay, I understand that's not always perfect for every niche because if you're a gamer, then it's probably going to be more about you know. The, the gaming thing itself um so but there's always something that you can create there's always some new experience not even gamers i mean there's plenty of times i've watched i don't even i'm not even a gamer and i've watched gaming content where i've watched guys go out and they like go to these competitions or you know they're doing something more in real life and it really changes the perspective for me that's when i get engaged because i don't you know I, don't, I can't sit and just watch people play a video game but i can watch gamers who are really funny or do interesting things or just take it to a different level uh so one of those things is changing that up and thinking about the different things you can incorporate in your life um to to make the experience of being a creator a little more intrinsic to your day um 
uh, let's see, uh, new YouTube member. So make sure network your future. Go to my memberships tab, and you'll see open up the perks, and you'll see all the new things that are available to you. Like you'll be starting to see members only live streams that'll pop up. You'll see content I've made just for members, helping you optimize your channel. And there's a Facebook group. Make sure that you apply for admission into the Facebook group. It tells you right there exactly what you need to do. Drop your channel URL and welcome aboard. I'm glad to have you. Um, let me go through some of the comments here. Uh, let's see. Let me see. Let me see. I've got lots of new members coming in. Um, love the members. Yeah, I hope you caught what I said. Make sure you go to the memberships tab. I'm just trying to read through. I never leave home at le without having at least one drone in my vehicle, but my channel is about drones. I th yeah, but I think that's it, right? Like that... I guess you never know when that moment's going to hit. And there's some of these things I'm not saying that, like, hey, just constantly be on the, on the ready to, to dive into creator gear because that can be unhealthy for relationships, too. If every time you're going to do something, you don't have a moment alone and you're not really in touch with the people you're with in the moment. But I think there you start learning a different balance, like John had, had said about. There's a balance you start finding where you go, I know how to quickly grab something that could be very cool that I, that I know it, like it's an idea. It's a thought. Um, it's a, it may not even, you know, just like, this is something I really wanted to catch. And maybe you come back to it later and you go, I captured a bit of it and I want to work. I want to work this idea into something bigger that I think will work really well. One of the things that I had talked to, um, uh, the group of my, my battalion group about recently was, you know, I, I did a, I was very intentional about the way I built when that Fillmore thing started happening. I knew that was going to end at some point, right? How, how many videos do you make talking about the saga? The saga went on, we got it resolved. Um, and once it was resolved, it was over, you know, it was, you know, I, I did four or five videos in there. There was, like, I think the only thing we had left was, um, you know, there was some, a lot of legal questions came up. So I had a lawyer come on just to address some of the legal questions. But like the last video in that series was really, um, there was one thing left was I had a, um, a DMCA takedown. Phil Moore had taken down one of my videos and that was left unresolved. So when I got to that point at the end of the series, I, you know, how long does it take someone to tell them that my, I got that, that reverse that, you know, Phil Moore backed off and removed that DMCA takedown. Um, it, that's how long it took. <laughs> how long did it just take me to say that? So I said it, and that was it. I, it. So the whole video was only a few minutes long, but I, but I wanted to open the door to remember the thing I said. Like, well, wh why would someone who's watching today's video want to go on and watch tomorrow's video? Like, what is in there? What's in there that's going to get them watching and keep them watching? And at all of the Filmora videos, they made sense because I was telling the story as it happened. So every time a new video was dropped, it sort of told the new chapter in that story. It made a lot of sense. But then when we got to the end of the story, what happens when you get to the end of the story? Well, I decided to start a new story. Um, so we were done with Filmora. And I, I don't know how many of you people saw some of the, the last video or two, but um, I, the very one where I talked about, okay, well, we got the strike turned over, you know, reversed. So everything's good, and, and now everybody's happy, except for this guy. And I had a clip of this guy who happened to make a whole video about me, telling me how I was going to get sued, and how it was awful, and, and didn't like anything about me, and then didn't like my hair, and said I wasn't a rock star. Um, and I put that in there, and just kind of laughed at it, and said, this is going to be the setup, because I want to respond in some way to this really funny video. He didn't mean it to be funny, but I thought it was. But the only way I can do that is by setting it up in a previous video. So I needed to find a way to integrate that. And that was me taking the people who had been on this Filmora journey, finding it really funny. Like, well, who's this guy saying all this stuff about Daniel? And then deciding they, they everybody out there needed to know who the guy was or else the next thing I did, which we finally came up with, let's just do a full-fledged music video. That wouldn't make sense. If you, if I hadn't set the stage and let people know ahead of time, who's the guy, where did this, where's this coming from? I had a lot of people who still think that was not a real guy that they, they said, Oh, you, that was really that, that guy, you should have hired a different actor and gotten someone more convincing. I'm like, <laughs> he was just a guy. It was a real guy. Um, I don't know. I guess he wasn't human enough, but he, you know, the, but setting that up so that when I made the music video, that had nothing to do with Filmora's saga and lifetime licenses. It had everything to do with where I had pivoted the story. 
And, you know, and that was a fun thing to do. It was just a, a different way to keep the, the, the journey going, and it gave people a reason to engage. And then along the way, this is one of those things we talk about a lot, too, thinking about where that can... Um, Amen. Oh, thanks for the super chat. Yeah, uh, I, I'm looking forward to working with you as well. So it's going to be some fun, my friend. Make sure you get into the group. Facebook group first. First, mission one, mission critical for you. One of the things I did was while Megan and I were working on that video, which was a ton of work, you know, we were thinking about, well, listen, this is a big adventure. One thing that happens, I think, sometimes is we get hyper focused on the world we're in. Like, okay, we're making a music video. And if you only get focused on we're making a music video, we're making a music video, we're making a music video, that's where your head's at every single day. We're making a music video. And what we tried to do was we really tried to think about, well, what goes along with making a video? Like, how can we, how, I, I don't know how, the video itself is very deep and there's a lot of work, but how can we go wider with it? How can we push the walls out and integrate things as creators to do more? So one of the things I um, I did was I was like, oh, you know what would be great in the video, Ma Megan? I need to have a shirt. I'd like to have a shirt that says like this, like not a rock star. And I and I and I did the design. So I sat with you know Photoshop or Affinity Photo, and I designed the you know the, the real simple rock star, you know, with the circle red line, red circle with the line through it, and just did the way I wanted it positioned. Um, and we were moving really fast and I designed that and I put it up onto spread shop, but I couldn't get the shirt there quick enough for filming. So I literally had Megan get out a, she has a cricket. I don't know if you know a cricket is. It allows you to make, you know, crafts and stuff. So she printed me the very first shirt and made the shirt that I wore in the video, um, by hand. So I had that shirt and then we launched the spread shop when the video dropped We wanted to make sure it we thought it would be fun. Like let's try to sell the shirt I'm in the video all the time, but showing off the shirt that says not a rock star And we put a little thing at the bottom like at the in the video that was like a joke. That's like please support a starving artist <laughs> uh, By buying the same shirt that Daniel was wearing in the video and a funny thing happened um, You know when we think about you know going wider um a funny thing happened. I talked about this. I talk about a lot of these things on like Twitter. Uh, and that's my place to talk about things. This this popped up here. I don't know if yeah. Uh, let me see if we can see this at all. Um, I got featured uh, in Colin and Samir's newsletter um, because they talked about the um, the I designed this this not a rock star shirt, but um, I became one of the top sellers on Spreadshop for that entire week which is there's a lot of spread shop owners out there and a lot of creators and people are you know use spread shop yeah i hit the high water mark for sales that week doing that that very shirt right there we just started selling it we had shirts i think we did a, a guy shirt a woman's shirt and then a, a, a mug a coffee mug uh, yeah i think i have the coffee yeah, i got the coffee mug coffee mug right there so it was just thinking about well how can we do different right so i'm thinking about I wasn't, I'm not thinking about how many views, how many subscribers. What I'm thinking about is how do we build something? How do we build something bigger, thicker, wider, and, and integrate different ideas for revenue strategies and have it be fun? You know, because wouldn't that be fun? Like if there was a not a rock star shirt that people could laugh about and go, that's cool. I want that coffee mug or I want that T-shirt. And we did really well with it. We also, along the way, had to investigate, well, let's put the song on the you know like itunes and and spotify like how do you do that i don't know how to do that we had to get like a we had to find a whole intermediary i thought like oh you just upload them it's like there's a whole thing you have to get like an intermediary i don't know what they call them not a publisher but a whatever uh, and we had to figure out how to do that and get it onto itunes and get it onto spotify and get it onto all of the streaming music platforms just to say we did now i do not expect to become a rock star from that but it was just thinking how wide can we go how many things can we incorporate beyond just getting our nose pressed against how many views can we get on this video let's do something bigger with it let's think about all the different aspects we can incorporate merchandise revenue revenue strategies how we can incorporate hitting other platforms with it right um you know, sharing it around and getting people to enjoy it, and it and it did just that because we st we stopped worrying about views and subscribers, and what we started really focusing on was how to do something different and how to have a great create a great experience. This is something that you're going to hear um, me talk about a lot. Insane McLean, thank you very much for the nine ninety nine super sticker, my friend. I really appreciate that. Um, where do you find the uh, links? If you're a channel member, Drew. 
um, if you're a channel member, what you want to do is go into um, the memberships page uh, of my channel. So just go to my channel and it has all the tabs. And there's one of them is uh, the channel members. And if you click on that, it'll there's a perks section. Open up the perks section. And it has all the has all the stuff available to you right there. How to get into the group, the different things that you'll be getting. Um, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, so thinking about the width, how to go wider, how can you do something different? Like not thinking just about, you know, getting your head pressed against the, you know, the idea of more views, more subscribers, and thinking, I'm going to do something different. I've said this a lot. What we're trying to do on YouTube here as creators is, is hopefully um, influence viewer behavior, right? Because that's what we want people to do. That's what YouTube's paying attention to. Are they clicking? Are they watching? How long are they watching? What are they going on to watch next? That's just so important. So as creators um, and consumers, because we're also consumers, we watch content, what you want to think about is, well, I don't know if I can change people's behavior. I, I don't think we can do that. But I know what we can do. We can change the experience. And if we give people a better experience, that can influence their behavior, right? If they come and they and they see what you've created and they see what you've done, then they've listened to your conversation and they've looked at the way you've presented the conversation and either they laughed or they chuckled or maybe they felt something or something you said struck a chord with them um, or something you did um, taught them something they didn't know or, or just made them, you know, made them could be anything. There's just so many different types of creators out there. Maybe it was a, maybe there was something you, you did that just brightened someone's day up a little bit or gave them a moment to escape whatever the thing that they usually have to deal with in their lives. And then, and when content does that, and when creators do that, that's when we start giving people a reason to remember you. All right. Because this is, there's a, a, a Maya Angelou quote that my, um, my pal Brian G. Johnson always reminds me of that people may not remember what you said, but they will absolutely remember how you made them feel. And people may not know every lyric to the silly song that I wrote, but they will know that that made them laugh in the moment or that it was unexpected and it came as a surprise. And that feeling of what is going on here is sometimes just enough. I don't expect everyone to go out there and write a song, but whatever it is in your world that can give, that can that can make people feel something, either thankful or, or happy or, you know, or, or introspective or whatever that thing is. Just think about making content that really connects with people on a very base level that make that, that isn't always just teaching people stuff. Our goal, I know there's a lot of resource, I'm a resource channel, utility channel, but it's not always just about teaching people something. It's really about communicating with them and listening to them and, and getting people to connect. Um, because I think that's just wor just so much more important, uh, like you do. Well, <laughs> you know, I, spoke, I, I try. <laughs> I don't know if I always succeed. Um, let me see. What is this? I like showing off what I do at work. Yeah, you know, I think that's part of it, too. Um, I don't know what you do for work, but Shake, Rattle, and Roll. I think your channel, is your channel a, a Demolition Derby channel? I, I know I've looked at this before. Um, yeah, I think that's the kind of thing. I th I think I I want to. I've said this a few times, and if I, if you've heard me say it, you get used to this old man repeating himself. You will never catch me going into the cold waters of Alaska and getting on a boat and deciding that I needed to learn how to crab fish. Um, but guess what? You will. When Deadliest Catch comes on TV, I get sucked down the rabbit hole of watching that show. You'll never catch me. Going out and trying to, you know, pan for gold in Alaska. But when Gold Rush comes out, I'm like, I'm right there with Parker Schnabel, you know, hoping that, you know, when he's weighing out that gold at the end of the day, that he's hit his mark, you know, that he's made money. And it has nothing to do with learning how to do those things, even though the stories are completely about crab fishing and they're completely about gold mining or pick whatever show you follow. Antique archaeology, American pickers, pawn stars. I don't want to own a pawn shop. I really don't. But I get sucked down the rabbit hole of the stories and the interaction because um, shows like that, series like that, production like that, um, does a really great job of of portraying um, the humanity in the people. And sometimes it doesn't. There's been times I've watched like pawn stars where I went. All these lines feel fake and forced. And then once I lose interest, I'm like, the minute it doesn't feel like it was really happening, 
it's just, I lose interest in it. Um, but it, I don't. Nev- I've never felt that with like the um, the deadliest catch or, or or watching Dirty Jobs when Mike Rowe is out there trying some crazy new dirty job and he's d- down in the trenches. Like the, I don't care about those jobs. I care about the experience and I care about the storytelling, and I get invested in the person, the people, or person telling those uh, those stories or teaching us something. So think about that for anyone out there who might actually be a, a resource channel, a utility channel, something that you teach people things remember that there is always story behind it and you will do much better for growth and hitting those goals if you can get people if you can connect with people not just by showing them the thing like now how quickly can you can they learn from you but th- how memorable are you how make how did you make them feel along the way did they, did they did you do did you make the content in a way that made them laugh or smile or feel something or feel like that you, you really took the time to go at a pace that made them feel that they were with you in the moment i think one of the things that people forget is on youtube you know, everybody wants, you know, hundreds of thousands of subscribers. But the reality is, is, you know, how many of you sit in a group and watch videos together? I mean, I might sit with Megan sometimes and on the television and watch. But in general, most of the time I watch YouTube videos, I'm by myself. Maybe on the phone or on the computer or, you know, I'm kind of in my own little world. And that's the kind of people who are probably watching your content too. Someone who's there on their own, on a computer, on a television, on more, more than likely on a mobile device, watching your video. And you have to remember that's the person on the other side of the lens, okay? That's who you're connecting with, that one person, not hundreds of thousands of people, one person. And every one of those individuals out there are real human beings that you're trying to speak to and you're trying to connect with. And if you can remember that, then you can start being more of yourself, your natural self, your authentic self, because I think people really do connect with the authenticity of of what you make and who you are as a creator. I should change my cover. It looks like a demo channel. When I started building those and driving them, oh, maybe that's it. Maybe that's what it is. See, see, that's one of the things. I, you know, like <clears throat> we've talked about this a lot. Making it easy for the viewer to understand, shake, rattle, and roll. I'm looking at your cover, and it looks like um, I have to now look at the channel again. Um, and it says shake, rattle, and roll. And to me, I'm saying that's a demolition derby channel. And if it's not, then then you, there's one of those things where you're making it harder for me to understand and connect with you. So when we talk about like getting focused on subscribers and views and all those things, focus more on the on the experience. Make the experience better. Make sure that the name of your channel is something that. It makes sense to the person you're trying to reach, um, whatever that might be, whether it's just your own name that you want them to remember you, or if, if you actually do have like a brand name like you have here, Shake, Rattle, and Roll. Um, I want to make sure I understand what Shake, Rattle, and Roll is. Maybe it's a music channel. Maybe I just don't get it, but it looks like a Demolition Derby channel. I know I've looked at your channel before too, though. But think about that experience. I think that's really important. Uh, Jason M., thank you so much for the super chat, my friend. Love your channel, Daniel. You're an amazing creator. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for all you do for creators. Whoop, did oh, I just get clicked off. I didn't get to read it. Oh, let's play fight. Let's fight it, Megan. <laughs> Both clicking at the same time. Uh, and the community, uh, you'll always be a rock star. Thank you so much for that. Much appreciated, Jason. I do my best. I, I do try. Uh, it's funny because, um, you know, like, I, and here I am talking to you guys about what I think you should focus on. And Megan and I, every single day, are in that rut with you guys going like, what's the next piece of content we should be making? We have all these ideas that we're putting together. We have all those external pressures. There's some people who are just waiting for me to just take everything I used to do and go, oh, just do it with DaVinci Resolve now. What I expect from you, Daniel, every week I want a new DaVinci Resolve tutorial and you should teach me how to do, to use DaVinci Resolve. And I've tried to make it clear, like, I did that before with Filmora. And you know what it did? It made me an unhappy creator and a burnt out creator. And it made a lot of people only continually ask for something else. They didn't care about what they were seeing. They wanted the next thing, which was good for growing a channel, but it was a never ending cycle of dance for me, monkey. That's not what I wanted to learn today. I wanted to learn something else. Teach me something else. And I was like, and as as much as I put fun into the the tutorials I used to make, turning myself into annoying orange or (laughs) whatever the thing was I was doing in that moment, um, you lose the spark. It takes the spark out of you. You know, it's like 
I, I have the utmost respect for school teachers because you know every day they, they go in and they teach kids and teach kids and teach kids, right? And then by the end of the year, that class, all those kids have learned the thing. And it's like, oh, they're these kids, I think they've done well. I think they've learned. And then what happens? You blink and then it's the next, it's the next generation of kids coming back in and you're starting from square one. And to do that year after year after year, repeating yourself, repeating yourself, repeating yourself... I have nothing but respect for teachers because I'm not good at it. I'm, I'm not good at it. I'm one of those people like I love trying to help people on their journey, but I'm always trying to find something new to talk about. I want to find some new angle or a new way to have the conversation. I want to learn something new myself as a creator. I want to expand my capabilities of what I do. And I want to sit with every other creator out there, all of you guys, and s see how we can do that together. Like, what do you got? You know, I want to know, like, what are you working on? What are you thinking about? What did you make? What, what do you got? What's, what's up your alley? What's the next, you know, what's the angle on the new video you're doing? What are you thinking about? What's the new series you're planning out? How are you going to do it? What, you know, what did you, well, how are you going to film that one? I'm, I love those conversations because uh, really getting your creative juices going and going, I, I, I'm going to try something so different because I got to, I got to be honest with you. Like when I do stuff, like I sit behind the scenes, like I'll send Dean Nimmin like the song. I'm like, all right, here's the, here's the B section of the song with a little snippet of me at the beach and, you know, just to see what they, just to get reactions from my friends and go, what do you think of that? And, you know, and try to get a feel for if they think it's working or if it's not working. Um, I love the process. I love the process of making stuff. So one of the things I would, I would really push you toward, towards is thinking about that, enjoying the process and trying to expand the process. I noticed most channels, this is from Piece of Leather. Um, I, I love that name, Piece, Piece of Leather. Um, I noticed most channels I follow have a uh, secondary person helping out. My channel is just me. Putting fun into leather work is a tough gig, especially with only one person. Um, I actually, I actually work alone too. The other voice you hear isn't actually Megan. I'm just a great ventriloquist, right, Megan? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's what it is. So. Um, well, I'll tell you this. This is pretty funny. Um, let me, let me um, give, show you a little uh, s sign of solidarity here. I started by myself too. Um, the only reason Megan works for me now is one, I grew the channel large enough that I could hire her. I could physically hire her. And to the pandemic hit, and what had happened was Megan worked at a salon for years, um, and the salon shut down. So she's like, all right, well, I have to go find a new salon to work at. Um, and I was in over my head, and I said, uh, okay, here's something crazy. Would you like to come work for me? And which is like, you know, how dangerous is that? Like, not only do you, you know, you're in a relationship, but now you're working for your boyfriend. That's not, that could be trouble. So we had to test it out and it's, it's, it's thankfully knock on wood, it's, it's tough, but it's, you know, it's been, she's, she's holds this whole thing together. She's the glue. Um, but yeah, it's like, it took, it took a while to get there. I was doing it all myself too. I was doing all of the scheduling. I was doing all the filming. I mean, I, everything was me. Megan will tell you, she never wanted around with cameras filming stuff for me unless it was like that one every now and then favor. Like, could you please, could you help me? Cause I, there's no way I can do this alone, but it was very few and far between. It was usually every day, just me. So one of the things you want to think about is. Um, if in my studio, I've spent a lot of time it, when I invest in my studio, um, and it's taken me a long time to build this studio. I hope no one ever thinks that I just threw a bunch of money at it all at once. It's been piece by piece based on needs and stuff. One of the thing, um, where's the ring, Daniel, where's the ring? What's the ring? What did I just miss? What's he saying? What is the joke? I just missed. He's talking about me. Oh, that ring. <laughs> There's the ring right there, Andrew. <laughs> like what? Oh, uh, see. All right, shut up. <laughs> That's that Mr. Andrew Cad, my uh, my illegitimate son, who I'm going to unadopt now if he keeps putting pressure on me to get married. Well, we've only been together a little over a decade. We'll eventually get married. Um, yeah, one of the things when I started building this studio here was um, when you were saying with the leather work. There's some things you can't really see. I've got like pipes up in the ceiling, and if you look at like the back wall here, do you see how there's light being thrown on like the Route 66 sign? There's a lot of these little um, aperture MC lights. These things run about a hundred bucks a piece, and I got a little mount arm, and I've got these things mounted in all different places to throw light. But you can mount cameras. I've got a camera. I've got a camera in front of me. I've got that camera there. That's the second angle. 
I, I used to have two other cameras here that I, I haven't used them very much. So I used to have an overhead and then another one that was up for doing shorts, 9 by 16 um, But think about how you can build uh, a, a situation that works for you. Sometimes it's just going, hey, I need to take... I always thought this was like a really cool thing to do. It's like some of your old phones, when, you, you know, when you're upgrading your phone, the cameras are so good recently. It's like, don't... Don't trade in your phone for the hundred bucks they'll give you or whatever it is. Or don't throw it in the junk drawer. How many of you guys have a junk drawer full of old phones that you don't use? You know, mount those things and turn them into multiple views. Get like one good camera shot and then you can do alternative takes. Sometimes it's nice to see, you know, when you're working on the leather that people can see the surroundings you're in. Like the thing that you do from a different perspective can be really helpful. So, you know, just think about what ways can you think outside of the box to make your life a little easier and invest a little bit of money into building things so that makes your workflow faster, that allows you to film. Like you said, working with leather can be tricky. Well, maybe if you make sure you have a space where you work, I'm sure you have some sort of space where you work with the leather, make sure that you've designed it in a way that you have different lighting and different you know, cameras or, and or phones or whatever you've got kicking around. And you can, you can hit a button and start, literally hit a button and something different happens that you need to have happen that gets you the different angle that gets you the different perspective and then when you go to edit you'll have all this stuff that can work together um there's just there's always an answer in there so but again i think one of the things i was talking about earlier you know how sometimes we do that thing where we're like you know well, why do you do things the way you do it because then, then the answer is always because that's how i've always done it and the ability to to challenge yourself to change and to think differently and go well what if i what if I did add more cameras or what if I set up a different space or what if I didn't do this right here? What if I, what if I changed the whole approach? What if I, instead of me talking about leather work, what if I just grabbed someone who knows nothing about leather work, brought them in and did a video about, I'm trying to teach someone how to create a whatever who, you know, a complete novice, um, how to make this, um, in their first try and bring up Cause sometimes I think sometimes people who are utility channels like us, maybe you teach people how to work with leather. What we forget is there's always story in there somewhere and story connects, you know, instead of just going, Hey, I'm going to teach you how to make this thing out of leather. That's great if someone's really interested in learning how to make something out of leather. But maybe there's a story where I tried to teach a complete novice or maybe someone who was really young, like a, you know, a, a you know, a nine year old, how to, you know, make a leather something on their first try. And then you get invested in the people, right? In the story and the laughter of like, uh, if you messed up or you got it right or whatever happens along the way. I think there's different ways to approach things. And I think there's always a new inventive way that you can expand the way you think about making content that can reach more people instead of just always trying to be a teacher or a gamer or a, whatever the thing you do is, right? A leather worker. Find a better way to do it because if a bunch of crab fishermen can get me to watch their television show and I have no interest in crab fishing, then I'm sure a leather worker could probably do something very cool, even though I, I've worked with leather before in the past, but I don't do it. I don't plan on doing it again. You could do something. You should be thinking to yourself, what could I do that would get someone who has no interest in working with leather to watch my content? What could you do to make that happen? One of the funniest things I, I told uh, a story in group, I said, uh, you know, I was talking to him and I said, you know, the, my recent, my recent video, um, the, 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 the Filmora saga, the very first one went over to, went over a million views. And I asked one of the, I was asked in one of our group, um, live streams, you know, I would, I had asked one of the members like, you know, why do you think that video did so well? And the answer was, oh, it's because you talked about something that was important to people. And I said, well, what was it that I talked about? I said, well, you told people, you know, about what was going on with the Filmora licenses. I said, okay, would it surprise you to find out that the vast majority of people who watched my video and commented said, I have no idea who you are. I have no idea what Filmora is, and I do not edit videos, but I am entrenched in this saga. And that was one that threw some of the members for a loop because we, and I know exactly why, because they think, well, why would someone who doesn't, I can get someone not knowing you wanting to watch this. They don't have to know you to want to, you know, to see the, what the video is about, but why would someone who's not interested in, in, doesn't know you, doesn't know what Filmora is and doesn't edit videos. Why would they watch a, a video series about Filmora removing lifetime licenses? And it's when I had to explain to, um, my coaching group. People got invested in it because of the David and Goliath story. 
it was one guy, one long-haired knucklehead YouTuber who was the very first brand ambassador for Filmora, and I explained my history, and then I explained what had happened, and I explained the turmoil of you know being a guy who t told people that this was a great software and get this license. They followed the story. It was the story, and that's why millions of people watched that video and, and watched that series because it was I, they went on a journey and it was the exact same thing i was telling you about you know you don't have to want to be a crab fisherman to watch deadliest catch you don't have to be a, a you know a gold prospector to watch gold rush it's about how you put that stuff together and put it out there for people to to consume and and i and i want every one of you as creators out there to stop just fretting about how many views do I get, how many subscribers do I get, and take a giant step back and say, wait a minute, how do I reach people? How do I, how do I tell the story about this thing that I do every day or this thing that I'm interested in in a way that gets the broadest amount of people to go, that was pretty cool. I like that. That was pretty cool. I think that's, that's where I would put most of your, uh, of your effort right now if you're a smaller creator thinking about trying to go to the next level. Um, Hyo Wu, thank you for the $10 um, super chat, my friend. Do you think you worked harder as a general contractor or as a YouTube creator? What was, what or, uh, what, what is or what was more stressful? Um, that's a great question. Hey, well, that's a pretty good question, isn't it? <laughs> that's a really good question. That is. Okay, this is what I've always said, and I, this, this is a great question. I have always said that, now you got to remember, as a general contractor, I used to rip the roofs off of houses and we'd you know put on a whole second story and then you know uh i used to go up onto big you know i used to build um commercial buildings too so i used to build you know, for a, a company that's not around anymore called daddy's junkie music stores i built 14 of their stores across the, um, new england so we used to go in and we'd have to rip out these you know these commercial buildings and turn them into music stores that you probably have anyone who's ever been to like a guitar center before design those things build them um you name it i've done it i mean the, when you talk about digging ditches i was a stonemason that's how i started out and so i used to start by you know um my stepfather was a mason and i would mix mortar and put stone in you know and carry it up staging when you're building huge stone chimneys um guess what you know the when the closer you get to the end of the project the harder my job got to be because he was way up in the air and we had to get to bring the stone up to him uh, I that physical labor, um, you know, you're talking about a guy who's had his hand go through table saws. <laughs> Megan can tell you the story. Um, you know, it's physical. Um, the physical part of being a general contractor was very hard. Um, now, that being said, I think YouTube is the hardest job out there. And I was a general contractor who I can I know how to do plumbing, I know how to do electric, I know how to do framing, I know how to do roofing, I know how to do tiling, I know how to do stone masonry. I'm a great carpenter, I know how to do finished carpentry. Um, you name it, I can do it. There's nothing in a house that I don't know how to do. You know, I'm probably not the best concrete pourer. I don't do a lot, you know, I've done some concrete work, but there, there's not much I haven't done. Now, I will say all day long, YouTube itself as a job makes you wear at least that many hats. You're going to have to learn how to, um, if you're on camera, you're going to have to learn to be someone who's good on camera. You're going to have to learn the equipment. You have to learn how to run all of these things and how they work together. Because most people who just get started out don't have a team around them that's going to go, don't worry, we'll order the equipment we you need and we'll come set it up and we'll make sure it's all running. You're going to have to learn how to do things like, um, you know, make sure that your microphones sound good, finding the right equipment, learning how the equipment works together. You're going to have to design thumbnails. So now all of a sudden you have to be good at photo editing and you have to understand design and layout. Then you're going to have to learn how to read in analytics because you have to learn the entire youtube platform you have to learn what what click-through rates are and what average view duration is and how to find those metrics and what they even mean and you have to start learning how to upload content onto youtube and then get you all the features of the platform and how to upload your thumbnails and then how to schedule a release and you know and how to write a description and how to link and use end screens and cards and you know links in the description and sit and answer uh, comments and then you, you know, oh, there's just so many pieces you have to learn how to edit video i mean there's people who make a living just editing video and that's only one piece of the puzzle for most content creators 
It's it's just so many hats we wear. So in terms of what's harder, there's a reason that the vast majority of YouTube content creators never even reach monetization, never hit a thousand subscribers and 4,000 watch hours in a year. The reason for that is cause it's hard and it's the hardest at the beginning because now you're trying to learn all these different skills at once. Um, and unless you have talents that you bring with you, I think everybody brings talents with them. Um, I think we all have life experiences that we bring with us as we start as creators, right? Like me having been a professional musician when I was in my, you know, twenties was a huge help because I had sat in, you know, music studios and I had sat working with some of the greatest producers on the planet. Um, and I had been on some of the biggest stages, you know, so I had been, you know, I know what it's like to sit and assemble music together, right? I know the idea of having to record and assemble things. That's a lot like video editing when you assemble things together. So a lot of that came from experience because it was familiar to making um, music production. I've been on stage, I've opened up for the Black Crows and Aerosmith and, and, you know, I've been, I've played on stage with Cheap Trick and so that, you know, I've been in front of microphones and in front of 5,000 people at once where it, you know, I, I know... I already had that feeling of, I used to do radio interviews when I was touring, we, you know, so we'd have to show up on these, you know, major radio stations and talk about the new album release or whatever. So I was used to sort of being in this, in this position, you know, here it is, here's a microphone, say something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> try to try to be interesting. So there's things that I brought with me and I think all of you um, have those things too. Some of those things that you, some of you are going to be much better at things than I am. I knew very little about video editing. Uh, I knew nothing about filming, uh, but I know nothing. I mean, what, aperture? What? What? ISO? What, what is the F-stop? I knew not. I had to just sit and, you know, just watch videos and learn and read and sit with a camera and, and physically see how it worked. When I built this set, I was sitting with Dean Nim and I'm like, you know, I would send him pictures and we talk and he go, all right, here's the problem. You're too close. You got to get back. You change the distance. That lighting's not, we sat and, you know, we just, jug I'd ask people I know who are my friends to, for, you know, some advice along the way. And it was just learn, 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 learn tons of homework. Um, so that's one of the things that I think I um, embrace that journey and that struggle, because if anyone makes it sound like, and a lot of people do this, they'll be like, oh, you're a, you're a YouTuber? <laughs> like, what is that? That's not even a real job. Trust me, it is the hardest job out there. And to be good at it and make a living at it is even harder. It's harder. So um, yeah, just know that going in. But I also believe that it's never been a better time ever to go out there and be a content creator. The creator economy is growing by leaps and bounds. Um, I have, I've got companies reaching out to me. Uh, I can't mention any names because it was all done in under, you know, non-disclosure, but companies who are like, um, hey, we have a software company is like, we have a licensing issue, issue coming up. We may be changing our policies and we wanted to talk to you because we know you've dealt with the Filmora situation and we'd like some advice so we don't screw up like they did. And, you know, there's just, I think that you, you never know what today's discussion, uh, what door it might open up tomorrow. I've worked with, I work with all kinds of companies. It's, I make most of my money not from making videos. Um, I make most of my revenue by working with software developers, working with other brands, um, helping them build their own channels, uh, all those other things that go along the way. AdSense is a very tiny piece of what I, what I make money off of, but I love the channel because the channel is where I can really connect with you guys. Um, the other stuff is more behind the scenes, um, doing channel consultations, all that stuff. That's the stuff that really pays my bills. Uh, so just know going in that it's going to be hard. Uh, it, just accept it and go like, you know what? This is going to be hard. Um, and if you can just know that it's going to be hard and know that it's going to be a struggle and go, but that's okay. I'm going to get up every day and I'm going to do it again. Because I know, just like we were talking about earlier, you know, playing piano for 10 days isn't going to make you a great piano player. Playing piano every day for three years is going to make you a better piano player. And that's what it is when it comes to making content, all right? I want you guys really to think about being in this for the long haul. It's going to be hard, but then just think about different ways to approach this. And remember that at the end of the day, we make videos to reach real human beings on the other end of the camera, the people who are watching, just like you're watching me now, every one of you, whatever you're watching, computer, television, phone, 
that everybody, every time you guys drop a video, there's someone out there just like you doing what you're doing right now. And you just got to figure out the, the, the way to connect with those people to get them to want to come back tomorrow or to get interested in watching your video that you drop next Tuesday, as opposed to all the other things that YouTube serves them. If you can do that and get focused on that and really be focused on connecting with people, I, I promise you the journey will be better and it'll be easier for you. All right. Listen, I hope this was a helpful conversation today. Thank you for all the wonderful super chats. It's been great talking to you. I got to get back to doing something. I got to build something. I don't know what it is, but you guys will know. You'll see it coming at you. I'll talk to you all soon.